Hello, everybody, and welcome to Planet IMEX. My name is Jonathan Bradshaw, creator of Meetology. It's a pleasure to be your moderator for this session. Our speaker in this session is Laurie Pugh Markham. She is the head of meeting innovation for Meeting Professionals International, and the session is Meetings Outlook, future predictions for the business of meetings. Let me tell you a little bit more about it. Given the pandemic, meeting professionals are finding it nearly impossible to make decisions related to the business of events. In this session, Laurie will deep dive into MPI's most recent meetings outlook research, published quarterly in the Meeting Professional magazine, and discuss the trends that are most affecting you and your colleagues. This is a 45 minute presentation. About 30 minutes will be Laurie, and then we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. So right now, I would ask you, as you're listening to Laurie, do submit your questions through the Slido function, not the live chat, but the blue Q&A section. I'll be moderating them behind the scenes, and we'll put as many as we can to Laurie when she's finished her main presentation. Laurie, we're looking forward to this. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. So again, going to talk a little bit about the meetings outlook. And what I want you to understand is that uh, this is, report is from August of 2020. However, some of this data we actually capture about two months before our report goes public. So we're going to walk through a little bit about the conditions and how they have progressed over time. And then, of course, as Jonathan mentioned, I will be taking questions at the end. So this particular survey is with 300 senior level meeting professionals from all around the world. So I will take some segments out. And of course, if you have questions related to your area, we can talk about those uh, in terms of your, your uh, demographics and what location you are. So what we were looking at right here is in August of 2020. So taking that back just a bit. So in June is when actually the survey went out. We do see that about 59% of the, the people taking this particular survey do feel that the conditions are unfavorable for the next 12 months, meaning that they are going to see a decrease in business. And then the flip side to that, though, is that 35% of the respondents are seeing that there is a favorable outlook over the next 12 months. Now, you may ask, is that because they're just optimistic or is it perhaps because they have diversified their revenue streams or they're looking at how they can expand their reach with hybrid or digital meetings and events? For this next slide, something that I want us to look at, as you'll see in November of 2019, so starting at the top line on the left-hand side, so that was really a year ago. And that particular survey would have been taken in September. So really before we understood what was going on with COVID or that it was indeed even around. And you'll notice that 45% of people did feel that uh, we would have positive conditions moving forward. And as you go along to August 2020, you're going to see again that that's 35% uh, are really thinking that perhaps it will be positive. And then on the bottom line, in terms of negative conditions, it's interesting because even in November of 2019, 33% of people were projecting that it would be a decrease or in negative conditions. And then that has grown to over 59%. So that could play a lot with, with where our respondents were coming from. Um, is it were they projecting negative conditions because they were thinking there was going to be an economic downturn in some uh, different countries? Now, for this next one, we get asked a lot, well, what is the breakdown? Uh, and when you're looking at your buyers and your suppliers or your planners or your uh, sellers, depending on how you want to call it, we did see that uh, for August, 59% of those buyers, so the planners in the group, did see uh, project that there would be a negative downturn compared to suppliers at 65%. And honestly, that really does make sense because our uh, suppliers and our partners out there were probably the, the first to feel the real pinch and the hurt from COVID-19 uh, as it came about. 
So this is pretty much the same graph. The only exception is that you'll see that there, um, there are some arrows showing, comparatively speaking, how that trend has changed since May. So we are starting to see that um, there's an increase in the number of planners now starting to feel the pinch of COVID um, and starting to affect the way that they project their business conditions for the next 12 months. Uh, and the the sellers, you could see it did go up in terms of uh, they're predicting there would be uh, some struggles over the next 12 months. This one is a pretty easy one to guess for me. Is it a buyer's or is it a seller's market? It is most definitely a buyer's market. And um, with only 11% believing that it is a seller's market. Now, you may ask yourself, well, why did any of the suppliers think that it could possibly be in their market share? I think as we start to see the 12 months come along and go into 2021, you are going to start to see probably some of the smaller uh, AV companies or organizations, uh, you know, not make it through COVID. And so you may say there may be less options to choose from. But for the most part, we will be projecting seeing it that it is a buyer's market into 2021. Now, um, how has that changed since May? Uh, as you can see that it has definitely uh, uh, gone up in terms of our projections in May of 2020. There are only 32% of people believed that it was a buyer's market. Now we're much closer to 75%. And then looking here at this, at this market that you can see is that over time, uh, we have definitely seen that um, there is a, a, a buyer's market starting to um, uh, decrease before we got to this August uh, time frame or this August survey and report. So what I really mean by that is the reason even back in November of 2019, people were starting to believe that it was a buyer's market is because so many different properties and hotels had convention centers had built on or add in. So the actual rooms or space available had gotten wider. So that also contributed to the fact that it was going to be a uh, buyer's market. Now, as we start to see uh, different live events happening, uh, we have a hybrid event, both with meaning in person and a digital audience for our November event in Grapevine, uh, Texas. We have seen that there has been a, um, a decrease in the amount of full time and part time jobs available. Uh, as well as contracting. However, I think the way that we are going to be able to see how we bounce back in 2021 is we're going to see that contract labor actually starts to grow. And that is going to be our first indicator that the market is coming back. Now, in terms of the greatest decrease in activity by segment, we do see that the, de the decrease is the highest in associations, followed by domestic corporate, and then closely thereafter, both the international corporate and international associations, uh, different uh, decreases in the activity by segment. Now, that being said, for the last 10 years, the government sector of meetings was previously the most uh, decreasing segment. Now what we've been able to see is that uh, the government uh, meetings and events are only going down by 5%. In, in relation to where we were with 15% average in the past year. So what does that mean? Basically, we with the governments, uh, the elections that we have going on in the US, we do see that uh, government meetings and events are really staying steady for the most part. And it also has to do with the fact that government meetings are within agencies that do continue to operate with a little bit more stability. So if I were you and you're looking for additional revenue streams or businesses, if you're a supplier out there is really trying to bid or get involved with as many government contracts as possible, depending on what uh, country that you're uh, located in. Now, projected virtual attendance. We show that 88% of our respondents do believe it is increasing. And of course, I'm seeing that across the board as well and that the in-person attendance is decreasing. You'll see that at about 86%. 
Now, outside of this particular survey, we are starting to see what you call hub and spoke model meetings and events, meaning that you do have a digital event, but that there are different watch parties that happen in different countries or different cities or states that can get together in smaller groups to participate uh, in these larger digital events so that you can still have a little bit of that networking. You can still bring some of the business back to the different AV companies and hoteliers and caterers. So we are starting to see that trend. Something else that I will also mention, um, in November of 2019, half of meeting professionals were expecting an increase uh, in attendance. Now, uh, with May already reporting that there was an impact in meetings, so what I mean by that is, yes, this report came out in May, but we were get, people were taking the survey in March when they were starting to get a little bit of a handle on what COVID might mean to their industry and to the particular companies. So you will see that in November on the left-hand side, that in November, 52% of people were projecting an in-person attendance growth. And then as we moved along into August 2020, the confidence confidence started to come down a little bit. So we were hoping that things would turn around a little quicker, but has not been uh, what has been forecasting and trending thus far. Now, uh, for virtual attendance, if you're going to look at a, a bright side or a glimmer of hope to what we have is that our industry has really embraced virtual meetings and events and has really perfected how they can integrate those into their um, forecast and into their portfolio of meetings and events. I'll give you a great example uh, for the Global Meetings Industry Day broadcast. We had actually been holding that broadcast for several years, and we typically would have about 450 attendees. Well, this year in April, we had over 11,000 attendees for that Global Meetings Industry Day broadcast. So um, I do think that was a little bit before we had some Zoom fatigue in the market and not quite as many options, but uh, I definitely planners and companies are figuring out how they can embrace these virtual meetings. And then now into 2021, figuring out how they can produce hybrid meetings until everyone begins to be comfortable meeting again. Now projected budgets. So we have 7% of our respondents believing that their budgets are increasing. I am seeing that those are increasing in terms of uh, production and audio visual for those hybrid or those digital events. And then 15% uh, saw that they had no change in their projected budgets and then 78% decreasing. Now, what we're going to see in this next slide is that this budget's decreasing was not just because of uh, COVID. So we were actually seeing in May of 2018, if you'll look on the bottom line of that slide of that screen, 54% believed that their budgets were increasing, whereas 31 uh, thought flat and 18 uh, in May of 2018, 15% uh, believe they were decreasing. Then even in November of 2019, before COVID, we start to see those budgets decreasing. So um, it's not directly related to COVID, of the, although, of course, it does have an effect on it. Now, what is fueling some of the issues outside of just COVID, or you could say that it kind of correlates with it, is the economic uncertainty. So 93% of respondents agree that the economy is certainly impacting business decisions, and that is up by 33% from May. And again, keep in mind, this is a global audience. This is not just a U.S.-based audience. So this is all the way around the world. And then you'll see that only 5% uh, disagree with the fact that economic uncertainty has infected their budgets or what their plans are for the next 12 months. Now, political uncertainty. Uh, yes, people agree that 58% agree that the political uncertainty is impacting their business decisions. And then 16% uh, uh, in the disagree category 
which before it was only 3% uh, in May. So what are people comfortable doing now? We find that 55% of people are comfortable going in and eating at a restaurant. And 52% are comfortable being at an outdoor event. I've actually seen several different meeting events and concerts that have been redesigned to be drive-in. So uh, drive-in concerts or drive-in movies and events. Uh, hotel stays. 45% 45 45 of people are comfortable staying in a hotel. You guys, I think that's a big win. I think we're starting to see a little bit more comfort in the protocols and the safety measures that our hotels uh, are, are sending out into keeping their attendees and their uh, participants safe. Domestic air, 31% of people are comfortable flying domestically. 31% uh, comfortable in attending an indoor event. We are actually seeing that same trend line. I get asked a lot from planners and suppliers is what should we be expecting for our in-person attendance into 2021? We are showing that there will be about 25% or a third of your attendees who will be comfortable attending in person but that just means you have the opportunity to also have that hybrid uh, event to where you can have a digital audience. And the real key is going to be skilling our industry into being able to create uh, both hybrid events that can uh, still collaborate and still interact with each other until we can get everybody comfortable meeting indoors again. Then we have trade shows. 28% of respondents are comfortable attending a trade show. 27% comfortable with attending a hosted buyer event, uh, receptions at 22%, and dom uh, domestic rail, so uh, by uh, train, at 21%. Now, what you don't see on this slide is respondent levels or percentages that fell below 20%. So the things that people are not quite comfortable doing now is international air travel, international rail travel, uh, cruises, large, massive indoor events, buffets, and shaking hands. So people are still not uh, open to shaking hands, even for those who are interested in attending in-person meetings. When asked um, how productive you've been working at home, we find that 42% of respondents are more productive working at home and 30% say less and 27% the same. Now, when asked that, if you add the 68% and the 26% of people that already have been working home at home, they do feel that they have been more productive. I know for me, I have been working from home for a little over six years, and I don't know if I can get quite used to being back full time in an office. So um, I think also what you might find that has to do with people who are more productive at home depends on uh, if they have children who they've been homeschooling from their homes as well, that certainly will make you not quite as productive. And then in terms of, uh, do you have any uh, protest contingency plans? We have seen that this number has grown. So now 49% of our respondents have added in protest contingencies in their plans for their meetings and events. And then directly related uh, to social injustice, we have asked, how has your processes changed in order to make sure that it's more inclusive? So in that respond, uh, respondents, they replied that they've either been moving virtual uh, meetings or events or canceling them. They've been releasing official statements. They've been working with diversity and inclusion committees, changing the way they do services proposals and hosting really important conversations at work. And I do believe we are going to see even into 2021 and beyond that uh, keeping inequality and learning at the forefront is going to be on a lot of the agendas of meeting and events moving forward. And that being said, that takes us to our time for questions, Jonathan. Thank you, Laurie. Um, Interesting data there. Um, I suppose in many in many cases not that surprising. 
Um, but I love the word you, you mentioned optimism and positivity. And I, I know those obviously don't reflect that so much at the moment. But I think um, one of the themes of this week is that. And I think obviously everyone in the, in, the, in the community, the business events community, is looking forward to when there's a more positive time. With that in mind, let's turn to some questions and see what people are, are asking. Um, some of these might be outside of your personal knowledge. I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll put them to you. Um, bit of a bit of a fun one. Um, have you heard of any drive-in expos yet? Have you had anybody? Um, are you aware of? Obviously, there's lots of changes in meetings design. Driving in expos does that make uh, does that does that sound a, something people could do? And have you heard of that in the research? You know, I haven't heard of it, but there's no reason why you really couldn't. So, if you perhaps had people drive in, the way I've seen it done for concerts is you actually get a marked off square where you can drive your car in get out of your chair, put up your, uh, get out of your car, put up chairs and have your bring your own food and beverage. And then you can watch whatever the program is on the screen. So let's say you had a, a keynote speaker and then followed up by then some uh, commercials or, or different kinds of information from different booths or partners. You know, we're talking about optimism. The sky's the limit. This is our chance to ideate and create and think outside of the box. So why not give it a try? I think it, it definitely could could work did you see brian fanzo session I, I i don't know if you did but he was talking about um yeah bringing these new ideas not not starting from scratch almost in terms of a mindset laurie to say let's not just try and adapt what we always do by adding technology but let's wipe the slate clean mentally and say well if we didn't know what we didn't know where would we start and uh i suppose there's no reason why that couldn't work i like Although I guess, yeah, being in a car is quite good. You're you're secluded, but then again, we're not going to get necessarily business necessarily business people turning up, I suppose, in um in automobiles. But anyway, a fun question to start with. Um, are there any insights you can share about industry sectors that are adapting well during this crisis? So, which <laughs> sectors, in your opinion, Laurie, are more or less resilient? So any sectors that have a focus on education, uh, at the MPI Academy, we have seen our certificates, our webinars, uh, any educational assets or downloads skyrocketing. So if you can look at your business and say, hey, uh, what can we offer in terms of white paper or trainings or education? People have been using this time where they're, they're furloughed, laid off, or not quite as busy to reskill and uh, learn new skills that they can take with them to improve on the job especially for those who, people who um, will be focusing on digital or hybrid events. If, if there's any piece of advice out there, even if technology makes you uncomfortable, technology is not going away. And so uh, the beauty of this time is there's a lot of forgiveness and, and patience if things don't go 100% perfect. But for those uh, media professionals who are going to succeed, they're going to have to embrace technology. And absolutely. And, and I would just add that if uh, on that subject of technology, if you haven't seen or didn't get to see Brian's session, Brian Franzo's session live earlier today, it will be available on demand. Uh, really interesting 25 minutes with Brian um, about technology and how we use it in the events industry. Um, let's have a look down here. OK, interesting. When will obviously you mentioned when the survey results that you published there were actually um, when the questions were asked that gave you those results. When will the next survey be taken for a good comparison? Have you got any plans to, to do this kind of thing again in the short term? We will. We do it quarterly. Um, if I'm thinking correctly, I believe that we will have one coming out in November or December. So it may already be in the works. Um, so I can find out that information. But I'm, I'm fairly sure we still have our fall one uh, that will be coming out or in probably December or late November. So we, we do it quarterly. OK, fantastic. Um, you mentioned uh, an MPI event. You mentioned WEC in the pre-chat. Can you turn into MPI specifically? Um, can you tell us what you did this year for those of you who don't know, those of watching who don't know, and what you're planning to do with the events that MPI do? You do you know, plenty of them a year. What's been MPI's strategy and how do you think they will um, be uh, in terms of how will they be delivered um, this year and uh, moving into 2021, Laurie? 
Sure, absolutely. So November 3rd through the 6th, we will have WEC in Grapevine, Texas. And as I mentioned before, we are expecting about uh, 25 to 35% of our normal in-person audience. So as of right now, we have 600 live in person uh, in people who will be attending WEC. And then we have another, I'd say close to 500 digitally. And of course that number is gonna grow as we get closer. What I think you have to remember about meetings and events moving forward, especially into 2021, is to focus on your regional or drive-in market. So when we looked at those slides about who was comfortable traveling, you do see domestically people are comfortable driving, they're comfortable within a certain drive-in market. Uh, and you can also choose to have those satellites or what we call hub and spoke uh, models for your events where if people do want to get together within their drive driving distance area to watch and maybe group in smaller groups that they can do that. Uh, and again, that puts money back into our, our local areas for our hotels, for our AV companies. So I think you should consider um, drive-in elements and um, those hub and spoke models. And then also as you're forecasting for 2021 and you're trying to guess how many people would we have live, you're probably looking at that 25 to 30% range. I know you can't see my questions, but one of them is about hub and spoke. Have you used that model specifically? Has it worked for you? It has, absolutely. In fact, our Netherlands chapter, uh, I believe it's actually at Scandinavia, our Scandinavia chapter is going to be getting together uh, to watch our WEC digital. So it does work. We've actually had quite a few of our chapters already starting to have hybrid uh, meetings and for their, their monthly meetings. So I'm seeing that they're usually getting anywhere from 10 to 20 people for their monthly in-person luncheon. Of course, all six feet socially distanced, everyone wearing masks. Um, and of course, you need to figure out what the protocol and the laws are within the, the counties you're wanting to put these meeting and events on. Uh, so it, it also is going to depend on where in the world you are located. So in Grapevine, Texas, we do have we have a 50% capacity level, but we don't have a max cap in terms of the number of people who can gather together. So that's actually how we're able to do 600 people in person. We actually could do a little bit more than that because we are staying within that socially distanced 50% uh, capacity range. So you'll just want to figure out, and that might help you figure out where you, um, your destinations of where you're wanting to bring your in-person attendees uh, and, and what their regulations are. Forgive me if I missed this because it's it's very difficult to listen to everything because of the questions, but but was that, was the audience you surveyed just domestic UK or the international audience that MPI have? It is the international audience. So it's not reflective of just of US or it is the, the whole world. Great. So. Um, I don't have an exact breakdown by country, although as I'm talking to my European uh, friends, it, it, it varies by country there as well. So uh, it, it's just going to kind of depend and your planning window is shorter. So I do not know that more European chapters were planning on having watch parties and then some of the regulations tightened. So you may just want to have to really stay nimble and flexible with your planning cycles and your windows. I mentioned the international aspect because one of the questions uh, is, is there any queer, clear differences between the US and the rest of the world? But that wasn't designed to split up regionally because well, MPI is an international association, but you haven't as yet um, split up that. Do you think that's something you might do in the future to get regional insights um, from around the world? We do have the ability to look at our, our data and segment it out uh, by request. You know, as long as we have enough advanced time, uh, we can certainly look at, at the different areas. But what we're saying is because our, our association is global, people wanted kind of just an overview. But it is it is possible to be done. Thank you. OK, another one, Laurie. Is this research showing that planners are shifting to small destinations and or smaller conference centers that facilitate exclusive use of their facilities? Um, are we seeing that meetings um, in real life, um, if they're happening, um, when, the one, when they are happening, are they going to these smaller destinations that, that necessitate less international, even longer term, longer travel, even if it is within domestic USA? 
So it, it's all goes back to knowing your attendee. So if you can understand one, where your attendees are located, what is the easiest way for them all to get together? I think the destination and the proximity to where most of your attendees are coming from will drive a lot of the decisions you make in terms of, of venues. Um, so something to also to keep in mind is sometimes Yes, the smaller destinations or smaller, I should say venues, the smaller venues would sound like a great idea, but you still have to make sure you have enough space to six feet socially distant. So um, it will probably be, depending on the number of people, you know, those midsize, if you're only talking about 50 people that normally attend your meeting and event and you're only planning 25 percent of that in person, then yes, you can go to much smaller uh, destinations. It just depends on on your audience size, where they're located. And don't guess what your attendees want. Send them a survey. Ask them what they're comfortable with. We know that, uh, you know, it, it really varies. And in the U.S. here, people's perceptions of what they're comfortable doing varies by state. It most definitely varies by country as well. That's uh, good advice. Great advice. Here's an interesting one. And you might not know this, so you'll let us know if you don't. Will MPI or is MPI planning any certifications around being so COVID secure for suppliers or planners? Mm -hmm. So we have partnered with uh, the Event Leadership Institute on a pandemic uh, certification. So that is already out in the market. Uh, and we also have partnered with them on the uh, virtual meeting and event certificate as well. In terms of actual cleanliness, there's a lot of different certifications that are going to be important depending on where you do business. So what the regulations in your area are. Uh, but there, I do know that there are certifications out there, uh, but the bandwidth to, pr to produce those is why we've really partnered uh, with Event Leadership Institute so that we can work together on those. I mean, the, the world is moving so fast that by, by the time you take time to produce something, things have, have changed so much. So it's, it's a little difficult. Yeah, it has made me laugh a little bit. Um, it's, a, it's such a fluid situation, isn't it? I mean, it's slightly unrelated to business specifically, but there's you know, for, for instance, France was on the safe list to leave from the UK and then holidaymakers went there on vacation and then it was taken off the list and people are surprised. It's such a fluid situation. You can't really plan, can you, for, uh, and that's the whole problem I guess planners are having. It's, it's such a fluid, uh, changing environment. Um, I say one thing I mentioned, Jonathan, and just because yeah. I did ask this, I, I'm on back to back meetings all day today. And every question I get asked is, you know, duty of care. And so every planner, every supplier out there needs to have a duty of care. So whether that's your audio visual company, how you plan to sanitize and, and keep socially distanced at your tech areas. Um, I can say at WEC, we, we're partnering with in-house physicians who will uh, take temperatures and, and give wristbands for everyone every morning and staff. We'll have rapid testing on site just in case someone isn't feeling well. Uh, we have security as uh, um, undercover security as well. And so it's really thinking about how can you do everything as safe as possible? How is the facility cleaning? How can you have um, touches check in? We're actually mailing people welcome kits with their badges and hand sanitizer. So um, it, I just encourage every single company, whether you're a registration, AV, planner, a florist, is make sure you have a duty of care plan. Uh, it's all going to be about making people comfortable. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, linking back to certification, um, for professional development, is MPI seeing trends more towards CMP, CMM um, certifications or specialized certification in virtual pandemic hybrid trainings? I know it links to the last question, but I guess it's like which which uh, journey or which which avenue is MPI seeing people are going down? We're seeing it all across the board. So a lot of times it depends on on uh, how much lead time a person thinks they have to study or to prepare. You know, it, it, time commitment. Can they do a six week certification? Can they do the the several months of of um, getting prepared for CMP, CMM. I know I, I actually graduate next month with my um, master's degree in meeting and events from San Diego State University. And that program has grown immensely for the next year. So we're seeing it across the board. People know to stay competitive or to move up or to get those jobs if they've been furloughed and laid off. 
they're really going to have to invest in their professional development. Um, yesterday morning, I interviewed Ray and Karina, and one of the questions to Ray was um, getting out his crystal ball. And uh, someone's asking you to predict the future as well, which I know isn't easy, but I'm going to throw it at you, um, if I may. Do you think we will ever go back to fully in-person events, or is hybrid here to stay? I mean, I, I think I know what you're going to say, but perhaps I can add a, an extra question. What do you think the future is? Perhaps that's a better way of asking. Sure. Well. At MPI, we've been doing hybrid components to our, our events for both our Global Meetings Industry Day broadcast and WEC for many years. So even before COVID, I would have said hybrid was going to be more of a part of our repertoire, to our toolkit of what we have. Now, that being said, I think for at least the next three years, and again, this is my crystal ball. We, if we save this recording and I'm right, I'm, I need to play the lotto. But I do think at least for the next three years, we will be hybrid. You may seem to see those numbers taper off because we do want to create a bit of a fear of missing out for the in-person uh, in the future. Um, so I, if I have to say is, yes, it will always be a part of our toolkit. Um, but I do think we will go back to meeting in person. And I think our numbers will bounce back even higher than they ever were before. Um, I think companies are going to start to see, especially sales companies or, or motivation of employees are going to see a dip. And, you know, we change the world when we meet together. We make decisions. We rally people. Meeting and events, our industry is all about strategy. And people are going to realize that if we don't start meeting more, and especially in person, that you are going to see a taper off in the behavior change in which we measure all of our meeting and events by. That's an important point, isn't it? When people are saying, what do they, when you're doing the ROI after the event, did you enjoy it? What did you get out of it? Will it lead to behavioral change? Um, I'm not sure what the difference is, but there's evidently going to be a difference between what people experience um, you know, standing in front of a webcam and watching Planet IMX or whether I'm, I'm, I'm at IMX America or IMX in Frankfurt and I'm meeting. And I think that's the, the real dichotomy the meetings industry have because it is quite rightly engaging. And as you say, there's been hybrid events for decades, really. Um, and they're not going to go away. Of course they're not. And you can use technology to expose the content of a meeting to more people in the short term via the technological platforms that then um, will hopefully lead for, to them coming to the real thing in the future. Um, but I think the dichotomy is, is science tells us that when we meet face to face, generally, it's it's a better experience and better is just one word but but there's so many benefits this is not knocking virtual or technology it's just looking at face to face more you know in, in a positive light um and that's going to be a difficult thing i think to overcome i don't know if ai has got anything to, to add to that in the future or there's been uh, different ways of interacting but zoom fatigue brian mentioned earlier on uh, creativity likability um, influence and persuasion can all be a little bit more difficult when we're not face to face. So I think it's going to be a, a real interesting um, thing to look at from a behavioral science perspective that the meters industry has to deal with in, in the future. Um, but yes, I think going back to the question, as you said, the, the hybrid events have been around for ages and they will always be. And they're only adding to the event itself, aren't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. A um, couple of last questions. I'm going to wrap up shortly. Have you experienced anything new that's blown your mind virtually? Back onto technology. You yourself, Laurie, whether it's in your MPI role or whether, you know, privately you've been on, on um, a different technology for, for you know, on, 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 uh, as a, from a personal perspective. What technology-wise has blown your mind in terms of human interaction in the last uh, six, seven months? You know, I... I really like brain dates. They've been around for a while. They did a lot of in-person, uh, what we call peer-to-peer -peer learning or idea sharing. So for those who are watching who may not be familiar, um, if, if we take just the in-person lens for a second, uh, if I look in, in, in my mobile app at the event and I can set up an, a date, a brain date, and say, you know what, I want to talk about meeting design 
and I would love to have a peer to peer group to talk to people, a certain number, usually like three to four people would sign up to say, yeah, I want to talk about meeting design at 11 o'clock in the brain dates lounge. Well, what I love about uh, what brain dates has done is they've, they've taken that to a digital audience. So you can actually do the same thing for your conferences and idea share and peer to peer thinking. Now, that being said, Brain Dates isn't the only company. Um, I would say that a lot of platforms are integrating something similar. I know we're working with the uh, Freeman platform for WEC, and uh, our attendees can see other people attending and can reach out to them and say, hey, Susie or Jonathan, I haven't seen you in a long time. Can we get together and chit chat and catch up? So I think we're coming a long way. I also like it's a very small startup company, but I like pickles. Uh, and I think that IMEX has worked with them before. But it is a, a audience engagement, just say, uh, like you may have done with a word cloud. So you could say, how are you feeling today? And people could put into the technology happy. And you would see, you know, all different words pop up on the screen. Well, this is one where you can actually draw on your phone with your finger. And you could say, what's getting you through the pandemic? And in fact, I use this for one of my certificate classes. And People, you see people drawing, you know, uh, their dogs or drawing a martini glass. And so it's it's all going to be about what ways uh, can we help people express themselves? I think emotional intelligence is something that we have learned out of this this whole COVID crisis is don't forget that, yes, we are we are businesses, but we're also human. So trying to uh, bring happiness and engagement and, and letting people just have a, a minute to express themselves. I haven't uh, pickles. I've not heard of. I have to look at that. That sounds uh, that sounds very interesting. Um, we're going all over the place in terms of topics because it's literally the ones that are being voted up. Um, back to COVID. Um, you did make a list. You, you did read out a list. But people are asking, could you um, repeat and re-emphasize the types of anti-COVID measures that organisers can offer to make attendees feel more confident? I know you may have touched on that again. Can you just recap on that? Sure. So I think having a duty of care video and a statement. So what we mean by that is, is what measures are is your facility, your AV as a planner that you're doing to keep people comfortable in a situation or in any crisis over communicating is key. So if you say, well, I sent out an email about my duty of care. Well, that's not enough. It needs to be on your social media. It needs to be an email. It needs to be in video, uh, in your know before you go, in your, in your app. So some of the things that you can uh, put in place is reminding people or requesting that everyone wear masks, um, keeping people six feet apart, understanding what your venue uh, is doing in terms of do they have the the sprayers that spray the rooms how often do they clean surfaces how are you handling food and beverage i have been so impressed by our food and beverage professionals out there who've come up with really creative ideas to still keep food covered but still attractive and and still a really good offering um tell people what they're what you're planning to do with your check-in if you're planning to have testing or or um, temperature checks on site, you should never, ever, ever, ever be relying on your volunteers or your staff to be taking people's temperatures. That's something you need to be outsourcing to a uh, professional. So those are really all the elements. Sharing room diagrams with with egress and ingress so people kind of know which way you're going in a room and which way you're coming out. Uh, you could choose to stagger times. Uh, I know we're wrapping up, but shout out to Al High. They did an awesome in-person event. They actually kept their attendees seated for the breakout rooms, but then had their speakers rotate. And I thought that was brilliant. So just trying to limit the amount of contact, contact that you have or up and in, in people moving around. Laurie, you've been amazing. You don't have any idea the questions coming in. You've answered every single one brilliantly and uh, on the spot. Thank you ever so much for sharing that research. We will keep an eye um, on extra research coming out uh, in the future. Um, and thank you for sharing with us this, this today um, here on Planet IMEX. Thanks, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I will just say to everyone joining us, enjoy the rest of Planet IMEX. Um, it's going to be another great afternoon um, if you're watching live and if you're watching on catch up there's so much more to watch do explore the back catalogue of sessions that have been delivered over the last few days.
Take care. See you at another event very soon. Cheers.